Over a year ago, we received a mini award from the Smithsonian Institute in support of their Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. This grant funded the cost of a Smithsonian Institute speaker of our choosing. We were interested in honoring women's history, so we have arranged Smithsonian curator, Lisa Kathleen Grady, to join us tonight. Our History Center board member, Dr. Leanna Fernandez Fox, will moderate the program tonight. Dr. Fox has been a board member since 2015. She's a proud native of Tampa. She received her PhD from the University of South Florida. She retired after 33 years of professor of mathematics. She's a graduate of the Leadership Florida and was national president of USS an Alumni Association, as well as president of the League of Women Voters in Hillsborough County. She's a member of USF Women in Leadership and Philanthropy and has served on many boards throughout Tampa Bay. So please welcome Dr. Leanna Fox. Wow, thank you. I didn't know all that was in the script. Thank you very <laughs> much, Nancy. And welcome everyone and a special welcome to our presenter tonight, Lisa Kathleen Grady. Uh, Lisa Kathleen has worked at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History since 1989 and serves in the museum's Division of Political History as a curator of American political history, reform movements, and women's political history, which includes the institution's famous First Ladies Collection. She's the curator of the museum's popular ongoing exhibition, The First Ladies. Her recent work includes the museum's new exhibition, the one we will hear about tonight, Creating Icons, How We Remember Women's Suffrage the voting rights section, a, void, a vote a voice as a co-curator of the exhibition, American Democracy. And um, uh, Ms. Grady was an author and member of the editorial committee for the institution's bookmarking the suffrage centennial Smithsonian American women. So welcome uh, everyone join me and welcome me, Lisa Kathleen Grady. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to share um, somebody named Lisa Kathleen Grady. It's a pleasure to uh, share part of St. Patrick's Day with you all. Um, I hope you're enjoying the, the poster exhibition you have on women's history. My friend and colleague Kate LeMay at the National Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery curated the um, version of that show that was installed in the portrait gallery. And I worked on its sister exhibition at the American History Museum creating icons, how we remember women's suffrage. And I, if my share screen works, I wanted to um, give you a, a sort of a tour of that exhibition. Stop once in the middle to, uh, to talk about it a little bit and then um, take you to the uh, modern section of it. We can talk a little more about that. So we're gonna hope that this works. Technology and I are not always the best of friends. Um, and for us. There we go. Uh, and I was just saying, I don't click right. There we go. Um, now to say that uh, the story of suffrage is complicated is putting it mildly. 70 plus years of conflicts over uh, competing priorities and philosophies and tactics and goals and alliances all played out over the decades as, as suffrage was slowly pulled out as a singular issue from, from the larger world of women's rights and, and as idealism and activism just ran headlong into practical politics. The ratification of the 19th Amendment was a triumph. Its addition to the United States Constitution meant that women could no longer be excluded from the polls just because of their sex, but it didn't guarantee them ballots. Now, citizenship laws and uh, state voter laws designed to enforce segregation, cultural prejudices meant that African American and Latina, Native American, Asian American, immigrant women, poor white women faced the same voting discrimination as their male counterparts. So it was both a victory and just one more step in a long continuing uh, journey to, to equality on so many fronts. So my job the last couple of years has been figuring out how to explain that and to relate that conflicted past to the complicated present using the museum's collection. And for many Americans, uh, they learned the story of votes for women as the saga of Susan B. Anthony leading a close knit sisterhood in a decades long crusade that ended in the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. This story of their victory, it, it inspired generations of women to fight for rights, and it still does. 
but it isn't the full story. And many women are missing from the version we learn in school. The traditional story was written by Susan B. Anthony herself, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Matilda Jocelyn Gage, and Ida Houston Harper in a six volume history of women's suffrage published between 1881 and 1922. The authors solicited accounts of the movement from women across the country and then compiled and edited them to emphasize Stanton, Anthony, and their organization, the American uh, Woman Suffrage Association, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, that's gonna be NASA to you and me, as leaders of a coordinated campaign for voting rights. Now, both the volumes of history and the collection that they eventually donated to the Smithsonian were created by NASA leaders to highlight the contributions of their heroines and their successors, you know, them, the people making the donation. NASA traced the origins of the suffrage movement to a meeting between abolitionist Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1840. Excluded from an abolition meeting attended by their husbands because they were women, the new friends took a walk and discussed the legal and cultural restrictions on women. Their talk led to an 1848 meeting in the home of Marianne McClintock in New York, where a group of women that included Elizabeth Cady Stanton meant to organize a women's rights conference and draft a declaration of sentiments, which included a demand for enfranchisement. Now that declaration, as far as we can tell, is the first formal demand for women's suffrage. It was concerned with remedying legal and social discrimination against women and was debated and adopted on July 20th, 1848 at the Seneca, at the Seneca Falls Convention. And Frederick Douglass championed the somewhat shocking, even for a women's rights crowd, demand for the vote. Susan B. Anthony was not yet a women's rights activist and was not even in attendance. That's going to become important later. But we know that multiple generations of women of all classes and races across the United States worked for suffrage and women's rights, in addition to Stanton and Anthony. Their struggles started in the early 1800s as women in communities across the country began calling attention to the political and social inequalities that affected their lives and they sought to improve them. It grew through the abolition and temperance movements which provided opportunities for both white and free African-American women to develop as advocates and leaders and to build alliances. They hoped that suffrage would lead to equality and reform. And for many, issues of race, class, citizenship, freedom, and womanhood itself were intertwined with the quest for voting rights. Some, especially Asian American immigrants and Native Americans, were barred from citizenship. They wouldn't benefit immediately from women's enfranchisement, but nevertheless, they campaigned for suffrage, believing that they would eventually cast ballots as free and equal citizens of the United States. So, through statewide suffrage organizing, through lobbying and national campaigns for a constitutional amendment, partic the participation and leadership um, in the movement for 70 plus years is coming from women like Frances Ellen Harper. Born in 1825, Harper was a contemporary of Susan B. Anthony and a leader in that generation of abolitionists and women's rights activists. She was the daughter of free African-American parents from Baltimore, Maryland. She was a poet, an author, a lecturer, and an original member of the, American, uh, of the American Equal Rights Association, which was founded during the Civil War to work for equal rights for women and African-Americans. And for Harper, equal rights was not solely defined by gender or race. In a famous 1866 speech, she explained that white women need, have to factor in African-American women's double burden of race and sex into claims for women's rights and suffrage. She supported ratification of the 15th Amendment to be followed up with another amendment to enfranchise women. And she joined the American Women's Suffrage Association, the rival organization to Anthony's, later co-founded the National Association of Colored Women. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This quote from her 1866 speech is justifiably famous and still painfully relevant. We're bound up together in one great bundle of humanity, and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. Um, ah, and I went the wrong way. I need to go that way again. Ida B. Wells is a, a journalist, an anti-lynching activist, and she's part of that next generation of suffragists. 
she co-founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago in 1913, and that same year famously refused to march in a segregated section of a Washington, D.C. suffrage parade, um, claiming that if white women did not at this point stand up for their African-American sisters, then all hope was lost, and stepped into the parade and joined the rest of her, con of, of her Chicago contingent to march. This is Nanny Helen Burroughs, a Washington native and a favorite of the Smithsonian, and our secretary, Lonnie Bunch. Nanny Helen Burroughs made a name for herself at the age of 21 with her speech, How the Sisters Are Hindered from Helping, at a 1900 meeting of the National Baptist Convention. She became a prolific speaker and writer on political and social issues affecting African-American women. For decades, she served as the secretary of the Women's Convention Auxiliary of the National Baptist Convention, that is always a mouthful to say, an organization she helped found. Burroughs believed that voting rights were part of African-American women's fight for full equality. A believer in individual and community empowerment, in 1909, she founded the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, DC, um, a historic landmark now as the school changed its name to honor her in 1964. The school provided academic as well as vocational training for young African-American women in a time when most schools concentrated solely on vocational and domestic service. Um, these women don't feature much or at all in the, you know, quote unquote, official history of the suffrage movement. It was about credit. It was also about controlling the image of the suffrage movement and its leaders whose reputation was somewhat tarnished. Stanton and Anthony were active abolitionists, but opposed the 15th Amendment if it would enfranchise only African-American men and not include all women. After the 15th was Amendment was ratified in 1870, they were committed to obtaining a woman's suffrage amendment. Their determination led them and their successors to focus their organization on voting rights instead of more expansive women's rights. It also led them to collaborate with people who did not believe that voting rights should extend to men and women of all races. Their speeches and writing in, of this time invoke race, class, education, and nativism as arguments for women's suffrage. The earliest arguments that had been made in favor of women's suffrage used familiar philosophical language from the American Revolution, things like self-evident truths and inalienable rights. Um, for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, suffrage would be universal based on citizens' education. Her objection to ignorant voters in the abstract translated into attacks on women, um, I'm sorry, on immigrants and African-Americans and, and her language peri periodically degenerated into racial epithets. Decades later, as suffrage edged closer to victory, leaders like Carrie Chapman Catt made the case with less philosophy and more pragmatism. In order to win over remaining states, particularly Southern states, in any way necessary, they invoked arguments that would have successful deprive minorities, including women of color, of voting rights as well as other rights. They contradicted themselves. They argued both sides of the question to get the votes they needed to pass the legislation and convince state legislators to vote for ratification. As often happens when activism meets politics that compromised possibly in ways they were not proud of and were not, um, were not right. They maybe they thought that after suffrage was assured, they could come back and they could fix it, but they didn't. And people never seem to remember in the moment that the way you win will carry forward alongside what you win. So suffrage was won, but damage was done. Uh, the words and calls for exclusion had consequences. African-American women in particular felt betrayed and vulnerable. After 1920, former white suffragists' refusal to assist African-American women being denied the vote bred distrust that still lingers. And battles over diversity continue to mark the struggle for women's rights. So to mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we wanted to create an exhibit that would look at who was missing from the story and also at how the memory of a movement the anniversary of a movement can be joyous, inspirational, disappointing, a call to action and a cautionary tale all at the same time. And that starts with a collection that's even older than the anniversary. In June of 1919, shortly after the joint resolution for the 19th Amendment was passed by Congress and went out to the states for ratification, Helen Gardner, 
she was the vice president of the NASA, that was the National American Women's Suffrage Association, approached the Smithsonian with an offer to donate a portrait of Susan B. Anthony. Essentially, they were saying, this is what we've achieved. Where's our spot? Now, NASA had offered Anthony's portrait to the National Collection in 1918, but the male curators declined the offer um, because it was determined to be of no special interest to the museum's history collection. In 1919, the painting was accepted, since according to a memo in the accession file, there can be no question of the historical importance of the movement initiated by Miss Anthony and now carried out to a successful ending. Notice that Anthony has somehow become the initiator of suffrage. The donation also contained personal possessions of Anthony's, who by now was being venerated almost as the patron saint of suffrage. It included her trademark red shawl, and it was said that one of the signs of spring in Washington, D.C. is Susan B. Anthony's red shawl, once again being seen in the halls of Congress as she lobbies congressmen. A teacup she bought with her, her, for her mother with her first paycheck as a teacher, uh, alongside the watch and chain she purchased for herself. Uh, NASA treasures, like the table that Elizabeth Cady Stanton used to write the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments. Stanton had given the table to Anthony as a gift. Um, Anthony had given it to the NASA. And the deification of Anthony was so complete at this point that early displays incorrectly labeled the table as Susan B. Anthony's, not Elizabeth Cady Stanton's. Um, and relics like this brass plaque that had designated the Susan B. Anthony room at NASA headquarters. Anthony's niece, Lucy, called its display in the Smithsonian the crowning glory to everything. In many ways, the collection is the material culture version of that six volume history. It's an amazing example of women proudly claiming a place in the National Museum, really for the first time women have done this, other than the First Lady's collection, and determining how their story will be told and who and what they want remembered about their achievements but it's definitely their version of the story. When the 19th Amendment was ratified, they were determined that their organization, not the publicity grabbing militants of the rival National Women's Party and their leader, Alice Paul, would be remembered as leading the long fight for women's votes, what they called the greatest bloodless revolution ever now. Um, they demanded that the display must be kept free now and at all times from anything that might connect it in any way with the lawlessness of a few women. That would be Alice Paul and her pickets, the first people to ever picket the White House. In 1912, Alice Paul, who had traveled to England as graduate student, uh, became involved in the British suffragette movement led by Emmeline Pankhurst. She returned to America determined to energize the American movement with confrontational techniques, including hunger strikes learned from British suffragettes. Um, she established the Congressional Union within NASA and you know, alternately inspired and infuriated its leaders. In 1917, she formed the National Women's Party and the organizations became bitter rivals. Um, Paul is an amazing, fearless tactician. She staged a grand parade in 1913 in Washington, DC, the day before Woodrow Wilson's election, or rather inauguration. The parade ended in a riot and Senate hearings about the conduct of the DC police. She led uh, the National Women's Party in picketing the White House, incurring imprisonment, and pressuring President Wilson and Congress to support women's suffrage. Um, she then lay, uh, authored the original version of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923. So you can see very different versions of the suffrage story emerging, all real, all valid, just told from different perspectives. So for the museum's exhibit, Creating Icons, we literally surrounded Susan B. Anthony with, and uh, the material from NASA, the NASA donation with the names, images, and objects of all those other women. In addition to Frances B. Harper and Ida B. Wells and Nanny Helen Burroughs, and you can see you can see the literal surround wall. That includes people like Dr. Mary Walker, a Medal of Honor recipient for Civil War service as a physician. Mary Walker was a prominent member of both the, of both national suffrage organizations. In her 1873 book, The Crowning Constitutional Argument, she reasoned against the need for a suffrage amendment. She contended that as citizens, women already had the vote. Congress just needed to recognize that fact. This, along with her supporting divorce and wearing men's styled suits, damaged Walker's relationship with Anthony, and she is conspicuously absent 
from the History of Women's Suffrage, six volumes. Nina Otero Warren in 1917 was recruited by Alice Paul to head the New Mexico chapter of the National Women's Party. And to extend their reach, Otero Warren ensured that their materials were printed in Spanish as well as English. Or Maria Lopez, head of her local, local college equal suffrage league, gave lectures in Spanish to ensure that the message of, suff of the suffrage movement reached the Latina community of Los Angeles. Mary Louise Botano Baldwin championed Native American rights and invoked Native women's power within their tribal communities, asserting that many had always had the right to vote. In 1913, she marched with fellow lawyers in the Washington DC suffrage parade. For Native American women, working for suffrage was also a way to protect their cultural and tribal sovereignty. And this is Hawaiian, uh, Native Hawaiian Emma Nakawina, and she supported suffrage as a way to gain back political power after the American annexation of the islands. She and her colleagues succeeded in per persuading mainland suffragists to lobby Congress to empower the Hawaii territorial legislature to vote on women's suffrage, but the 19th Amendment was, was ratified before they could. Um, in the early 1900s, Rose Schneiderman, a young fat immigrant factory worker, became a strike leader, union organizer with New York's garment workers. She brought the confrontational tactics and public displays of labor actions to the suffrage movement, worked closely with elite New York suffragists while championing the specific priorities of working class women. Um, you can compare her with someone like Mary Elizabeth Lease in the 1890s, who spoke for women's suffrage through the Women's Christian Temperance Union and through the more radical politics of the Knights of Labor and the Populist Party to promote uh, suffrage in, in, San, in, sorry, in Kansas. And in the early 1900s, Chinese women immigrants could not become citizens. Uh, first generation immigrants, though still advocated for suffrage for their native born, uh, American born children. So Mabel Lee wrote at the head of a New York suffrage parade in 1912 and was a member of the Women's uh, Political Equality Union. And Dr. S.K. Chan, the only picture we've ever been able to find of her, so it's very grainy, was the president of the Chinese American Equal Suffrage Society in Portland, Oregon. She gave pro-suffrage speeches in Chinese, emphasizing that the country of her birth had already enfranchised women. Now, we wanted to pair this diverse and contested story with two other events um, where the inspirational memory of suffrage, as well as the struggles for diversity left over from suffrage play a part. But first, I thought we might be able to take a break and talk a little about the older half of, this, of, of the suffrage movement itself, if y'all have questions or comments. That's terrific, Lisa Kathleen. Thank you so much. I particularly am enjoying the new faces and names that I don't think we normally uh, connect to the women's suffrage movement. And I would particular was very happy to see the two Latina women who were there and um, uh, all the other um, groups that are represented. Um, bottom line is it takes more than a village. It takes a world, it seems, <laughs> to make this happen. So um, thank you for that. I see we have two questions. Uh, I'm going to read the first one. It says, can you elaborate on the involvement of churches in the movement and its significance in moving public opinion. Before you start to answer, I should remind everyone um, how they are submitting questions. So you can either submit them through the Facebook chat or on the Zoom chat. Is that correct? Am I saying that properly? Because I don't have a question and answer thing. Oh, I yes, see. That's okay. Yes. Okay. So you can do it either way through Facebook or through Zoom. I'll repeat the question. Okay. Can you elaborate on the involvement of churches in the movement and its significance in moving public opinion? I would say it depends on the, on the as, as with all of these things, if there was a, a pro-suffrage entity uh, in, 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 in women's communities and an anti-suffrage, anti-suffrage organizations in, in women's communities. It's a, it's a subject that split groups, it split um, all kinds of organizations. Churches were one of the ways in which women could organize, um, and women's church, women's church groups are a way that give women a voice both within the church community and it gave them a position to have a voice in the outside world, the world outside their church community, and to take on a variety of issues um, 
for the betterment. The things that count as the betterment of mankind and womankind are, are such logical things to discuss in church groups. And so this was a, a, a logical place for things to begin, uh, especially in the African-American community. Church groups were um, a great um, a great organizing entity. Um, also the, the club movement of the progressive era of the, the 19, um, the late, the late 19th century, early 20th century gave um, different groups of women, um, African-American women, white women, um, uh, working class women, ways in, in which they could organize around themes and merge suffrage with the other, the other concerns that they had. Um, one, of, one of the things that's talked about when you talk about suffrage is the idea of, so in, in the progressive era in general, is the idea of social housekeeping. So women are, women are simply moving that natural sphere they have, uh, you know, quote unquote, as um, taking care of the home and taking care of, um, of keeping things healthy and keeping things safe and moving it out into the wider world, which is how they move into things like labor reform and political reform. And to do that, you need, you need votes. Um, women worked for any number of time through volunteer organizations. And, and there always comes a point where you realize you can only do so much without having the votes to then influence legislation. And I, I think that becomes a tipping point for um, a, a lot of women in a lot of places. They, they've made all the progress they can and they can't make any more progress until they can have an active say in legislation. I think we could probably add to um, the comments about involvement in churches and where women found a place for their voices and their strength. It seems, especially in this last uh, election, that uh, national uh, fraternities and sororities also mm -hmm. became very active and playing a role in, uh, again, finding their voice. So, and we're, we're very active in the suffrage movement. Right. Here's a second question. Okay. Why was the involvement of Southern women so limited or was it just not as covered by the press? Um, there is support for in the South for, for suffrage, but the predominant, and, and it's interesting, it's argued two, way, two ways. There's a, it just depends on which side of the political spectrum you're on, but, but the, the, the Southern the southern states had not independently given women the vote. So, so southern where, where western states had, eastern states had, the southern states and a lot of the Midwest, some of the Midwest states had not granted women suffrage within their own state. And a lot of this has to do with keeping control of the of the state. If you're unsure of how new voters, adding people to the voting rolls is always risky to the, pe to the people in power. You don't know, you're adding people that no, don't necessarily share your concerns, um, won't necessarily vote the same way that you want them to, will have different priorities. And so you've got to share a power base with them. And adding people will can potentially dilute the number of votes that you're going to have, add votes to your rivals. And if you don't know how people are going to vote, you tend to want them not to vote. And, um, <laughs> There's a traditionalist core in a lot of the Southern states that say that women play a better role having in influencing votes, not casting votes themselves. Um, so the, although there are active suffragists in the South, its culture is more at this time is more set against suffrage. And, and in most of the states that voted against the 19th Amendment were Southern states, mm -hmm. which is why there was so much drama in Tennessee. When Tennessee yeah. comes down to one vote, to, to be the final state that ratifies the amendment. Right, and he was influenced by his mother, correct? By his mother, yes, was going to vote no, and his, yeah. his mother encouraged him to, to help Mrs. Cat and put and, and vote for ratification, and he switched his, switched his vote and, and became the, the tipping vote. Okay, we'll take one more question and then go back to the second half of your presentation. Uh, Stanton seems to believe voters needed to be educated what did that look like to her and in that time? I think Stanton believed that you should be questioning, that you, that you should be well-informed, that you should have a, 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 a formal education of some kind and that you should have the ability to parse out what you're voting, the, the subjects on which you're voting so that you can actually 
think about which side is right. You can think about a piece of legislation. You can think about a party's platform and that you will, you will make votes. You will vote based on these, these rational decisions about, um, about voting. Now, Stanton, Stanton's a snob. Stanton probably wouldn't have considered any number of us to be, to be people that should be voting either. Um, she's, she's had a rarefied life. Um, she's had a privileged life. She's had, for a woman who had no formal education, she, she, her father tutors her and allows her access to his library. And, but she, but she does believe because she taught herself and he taught her, she does believe that you can gain education. And, and when you have done that, you are ready to be, you know, stand with the voters of, of the United States. I mean, she is someone who believes that she should vote. She believes that Frederick Douglass should be voting. She believes that uh, Francis Harper should be voting. She probably does not believe that um, a fluffy, I can't believe I just said fluffy, but a, that a, you know, a, a quote unquote airheaded um, society matron should be voting hmm. if they have not self-educated and are able to think in these ways. So her... I think her view of what that is, is broader than she, originally broader than what she starts to talk and what she starts to, to reduce it all to in, in anger and strategy and goodness only knows what starts to become much more racial, much more class about class and race than it would have maybe when she, when she started. Stanton is always confusing to, to, to people. It's, it's where it becomes very difficult to try and figure out what, why people behave the way that they are. And that's, that's one of the things that motivated me in the exhibit. We can spend a lot of time trying to decide if this person was a racist or a classist or, or what they believed in their heart. And we don't know, we'll never know what they believed in their heart for very few people, they, they, they write down what they believe. What we know is what they said. So in some ways, what you believe is between you and your God, we'll never know. We know what you said. We know what you did. And whether you believed it or not, you said it and you did it. And that was, as I said, you, you, what, how you win something will be remembered with what you won. It's okay. sort of what your mother always told you. You have to think about what you're saying and, and the effects that it will have. Um, We've become a society that plays to win in politics and we'll play a lot of unpleasant cards to win in politics and, and did back then. And I, I think it's, to me, it was very important that we thought about that and, and what it is that you, where you compromise and what you sacrifice to, to gain your goal because it will taint, it can taint the victory that you win. Okay, let's go on. And uh, I'm getting some text messages, four of them so far from friends who are listening and enjoying very much Kathleen, Lisa Kathleen, excuse me. That's um, fine. But they are not showing up on our list. I don't ah. know if that means that they can or cannot ask questions, but since you obviously have my cell phone number, you can send <laughs> your questions through my cell phone as well. So we'll go ahead, go ahead. You're Lisa. the secret link. Yeah. All right, well, I, as I said, we wanted to talk about, um, how all these things, this, this victory that's somewhat tainted, these tactics that, that fissure the, the movement, the people who have forgotten. We wanted to talk about how that moves into modern, modern women's rights because suffrage, suffrage lingers with us. It wasn't just a victory and, and now we've moved on. It, it continues to inspire and to inflame in some ways. So we wanted to bring, show that struggle and the lingering effects on the suffrage movement beyond 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. So we used collections representing two moments in recent memory where Smithsonian curators were live on the ground collecting. So we paired the suffrage with the 1977 Women's Conference and the 2017 Women's March. Um, national conferences have been a regular part of uh, suffrage and early abolition and women's rights and continued on. And then in 1977, 2000 delegates gathered in Houston, Texas for the first federally funded women's conference. Gloria Steinem calls this one of the most important events in women's history that no one remembers. 
It was purposely diverse and demographically representative. Um, stay, it, it really was the, the, the most diver purposely diverse and demographically representative group ever assembled in the United States. Each state sent delegates to debate proposals um, and the, de their delegation had to reflect the demographics of their state. That was a requirement. They debated proposals um, promoting equal rights, ending discrimination toward women that they would then package and send to the president, that was Jimmy Carter, and Congress for action. Now, while white participants held diverse, sometimes opposing views, for many of them, it was the first time that they met and talked for any length of time with women of color or women with life experiences who were different from their own. This is uh, the arena in Houston. Now they expected disagreements beyond liberal and conservative, between liberal and conservative delegates, but many did not anticipate that issues of poverty, education, employment, and safety were of equal or greater priorities for feminists of color, um, more so than simply passing the ERA. It was an event that consciously drew on, suffer, uh, on the suffrage movement for imagery and inspiration. Um, they even ran that torch from, in a relay from Seneca Falls, New York, where it was kicked off and it was run uh, where the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments and that first public demand for women's suffrage took place. And it was run in a relay to Houston um, and carried into the Houston arena by these three women and by, uh, and Bella Abzug, who, who was the, the leader of the um, convention and who sort of jogged with them the last little bit. Um, but the feminists of, the, of 1977 were, or, or, sorry, but the feminists of 1977 also remembered Alice Paul and those lawless women who picketed the White House. Vendors at the conference sold buttons with her name and uh, you can see that's, that's the button on this uh, sash and marches for the ERA that year and beyond were held in Alice Paul's honor. Reproduction of the jailed for freedom pins originally awarded, awarded to the women who were imprisoned for picketing the White House, or uh, this is an original pin, were also on sale. And you could buy them as a token in inspiration uh, promoting ERA and the 1977 conference. African-American poet Maya Angelou linked women's rights activism past and present in this, uh, into form a more perfect union. This is the statement she crafted for the conference. And it acknowledged, and this is a quote, history's positive achievement to inspire us and the negative omissions to teach us. The declaration committed the participants to honor the suffer, the famous and the unsung and to recognize the challenges that others face and to seek justice for all women. And you can see there are pages upon pages of signatures and it was signed by every one of the women who ran the torch in, a, in, a, in the relay and then was, was signed by some other delegates at the conference itself. Hundreds of that, I'm sorry, I'm having a, having a, slow, a, a moment of plague brain. It happens to me every now and again. So I, I skipped a page or I, I, I jumbled my pages. So we've skipped from, so 1977 was this sort of combination kumbaya and um, moment and a realization that women were not as united as the organizers maybe thought that women were. So it was a moment where they realized that um, white middle-class women's primary issues were not necessarily the issues for working class women, Latina women, African-American women, rural women, um, urban women. They weren't the same for everyone and that the movement was gonna have to do a better job of acknowledging everybody's needs and working for everybody's needs. And infamously, the, um, infamously, the, the section in the prefab arrangements for the, for the the starting point proposals for the, for the conference, what was called at the time in the language of the, of the 1970s, the minority plank was recrafted in after hour sessions by delegates. This is the first time they all got to meet together, the Native American women with the African American women, with the Asian Pacific women, with Gloria Steinem running between the groups, acting as the unofficial secretary, putting it all together. It was uh, this much longer, much more complex new plank was presented by Coretta Scott King and um, unanimously accepted by a crowd that then broke into singing We Shall Overcome. 
So it was a, you know, a moment that was joyous and contentious and a real learning moment, we hope, for, for, um, for, for, for the movement to, to keep progressing forward. Lisa, Kathleen, excuse me, but this is right on your point. One of the questions says, was Gloria Steinem on stage at the 1977 conference? Gloria Steinem was on stage at various points in the, in the 1977 conference. Um, along with Lady Bird Johnson and Rosalind Carter and Barbara Jordan, one of my favorite people of all time, um, Bella Abzug, a, a variety of people. One of the things we have in the collection is actually the gavel. They wanted Susan B. Anthony's gavel. They wanted us to lend the ivory gavel, um, kind of take it symbolically gavel in. And the conservators just said it was too fragile, it couldn't go. So we took a wooden one, curator hand carried it. Someone, if you see the film, someone's actually holding it up at one moment, gives it back. Um, Bella Abzug used a reproduction of that gavel, but for some reason, Steve was selling reproduction Smithsonian gavels. I have no idea why or who bought them, but she <laughs> used one and banged the, plat the, the, the podium so hard she broke it. And then they donated that gavel to the Smithsonian. So we frequently, it's on exhibit right now with the real one um, in this case. I uh, know in the first case, I have to go back. Um, we sometimes say, this is why we don't let people hit things with the objects. But it shows the, the power that the imagery of suffrage, that the link to suffrage had, that the fight is still ongoing and drawing this idea of inspiration and strength from the generations that have come before you. And that comes up again in, in 2017. And this is the women's, we were on the ground, it, landlocked along with the rest of the mass of people trying to collect at the march. Um, we're very thankful that the Smithsonian doesn't let you bring signs into our building. So our, our buildings crew will put out very clean bins for you to put them in. People hide them if they want to get them back and we never touch the signs that they hide in the bushes. We know that you, you're coming back for it. But if you put it in the bins, we would go out and periodically troll the bins um, for the signs you don't want anymore. We help you so you don't have to take it home um, and to clean up the mall. And that's where a lot of these signs actually come from. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of women took to the streets in the nation's capital and, and millions joined in sister marches across the country and around the world. These women hope to revitalize the movement and to send the message that women would continue to fight for social justice. Um, women of color who felt marginalized since the suffrage movement took this opportunity to really remake feminism activist, activism in their own images which became the, the, I mean, the signs, the really hard to get um, imagery, iconic imagery of that march. Now, this is, an, is a consciously intersectional movement determined to avoid the exclusions of the past and being as inclusive as it can while navigating the challenges of, of organizing a diverse constituency, which ran it into its own problems. But it is, it is so wonderful to see in a march, people carrying signs that say, you know, military mom, Latin immigrant, I am America, along with signs invoking the, the, 20, the 1913 march that it also clogged the DC city streets. And the sign on uh, the left is invokes that parade and Inez Milholland who, who led the parade on a, on a white horse. So you have this wonderful, this movement forward into a diverse world and still this attachment to draw, be able to draw inspiration from the past imperfect as it may have been. Um, this sash was worn by a marcher whose great grandmother had actually been a suffragist. And the back of it says 1848 to 2017. Hmm. New symbolism and iconic images emerged. Um, putsy hats were just ubiquitous during the 2017 march in various shades of pink and customized in how they looked. Um, but the hat later created its own controversy as some activists believe that, believed that by its color and its, it was a, and its name, it was exclusionary to women of color and to trans women and began to discourage its use, you know, proving that icons and symbols are viewed differently by different people. And we, at a much faster pace now, make and remake both movements and, and their imagery. Suffrage was a victory. Um, in 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, there were no women serving in Congress. It was a fluke. You're thinking Jeanette Rankin, I know, but Jeanette Rankin, um, in, who was elected in 1916, ran for the Senate in 1918 and lost. So she was out of Congress at that moment and the woman elected in 1920 wouldn't be sworn in until 1921. Um, 
In 2020, during the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, there were 130 women serving in Congress. So to celebrate that, the exhibit includes a section called 100 Years, 100 Women, displaying campaign buttons and stickers from the 127 representatives and senator, um, no, 130 representatives and senators, as well as the gavel used by Nancy Pelosi, the first woman speaker of the House. Um, so we opened that show on March 5th, 2020, uh, just a year ago, before uh, a week before the museum closed to the public. Um, and we closed for COVID, that the exhibit is waiting patiently in the dark for uh, life and for curators and for visitors to come back. Um, and you can see it online uh, until then, and hopefully we can share that link with you. And we hope that when visitors see it online or in person, they'll come away knowing that the suffrage movement was um, involved many more people than they might have thought, that um, it was a much more diverse movement than they might have thought, and that the priorities that people had for the movement were different than just that, that, that singular drive for the vote. That issues of inclusion and exclusion in its various forms were present then, remain present now, and we must be cognizant and worked on, work on them. How the words and justifications you use to argue for a cause will carry along into the memory along with the success or failure of its objective. And really, taking all of that on board to still come away knowing that the memory of a movement, even an imperfect one, can inspire us to create a more inclusive present and future. Great. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. We do have a, um, time for a few more questions, if you're willing, Lisa Kathleen. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, one of the um, questions comes from an attendee that asks, do you see any similarities with current marches and protests, thinking back to the messiness of the March of 2017? Uh, if you're in DC, almost anything you think now when you think of a march is, is January the 6th. Um, and certainly we've never seen... <sighs> I think, I think it's very interesting to see how, it's such an easy thing to say that, um, uh, you know, oh, it took over the streets. I mean, we say it lifely, it, it clogged the city streets, it took over the streets. Um, but there's a palpable feeling to a movement and a march and a day that is moving with optimism and moving with determination and one that is not. Um, and maybe some of that, I, I probably residents of any city that lived through marches sense that when things are going on in DC, it's so standard for us. There's always a protest. I mean, every day of the week, there's a protest somewhere in DC, large or small. So we're, we're used to them, but the, 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 there's a different feeling for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say protests that seem pro forma. Um, you know, today's the day we're going to protest this and the people involved in it are always very passionate and, and um, committed. But there's, there's something that happens when a, when a large number of people come together with optimism and hope and spirit. And the 2017 March, I think was so full of that. Um, we weren't out, I was not out, my colleagues were for some of the Black Lives Matter protests in, in Washington and, and felt some of the same feeling. Um, so I think it's, it's interesting to watch the motivation and orientation of marches because all marchers are passionate, but marches tend to feel a little, a little different. Um, and I'm, I'm interested to see, and that has nothing to do with their political orientation necessarily. Um, every, every year we frequently have, um, two, two, a few days after the 2017 uh, Women's March was the right to light, the March for Life. Both not entire, you know, not conflicting messages, but not um, not necessarily the same groups of people who were out to protest, uh, who were out to protest and demonstrate. Yet they both had um, there were similar similar feelings to portions of those marches. 
um, people who are committed and had, had optimism in what they were what they were doing. So it's it's interesting to see how that plays out in well, people. One, I'm, I'm sorry, one, I'm rambling. Um, in people yeah. who who come out to march, it's because I'm thinking out loud as I'm trying to analyze this and 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 what I think about it. Because now I'm comparing it to going to political rallies that are absolutely political, like being in a conventional hall and what the feeling is like there because you have the excitement and you have the passion, but how they all, how they all work differently. And, you know, I don't have, I'm going to take the long way around and say, I'm going to have to think about that more because now I am, now I am really thinking that through and in, in how I would measure them all, how I would analyze them all against each other. And that's it's probably that a question that'll a come up often now, I think. Yeah, I, I, th I think it is. It's, yeah. it's because they, they, they seem different now. They, they seem, every March doesn't seem like same group of people, different topic. But basically, it fits into a mold. Now they now they seem slightly different. Uh, here's a question on a lighter topic. Uh, <laughs> someone is asking, how long will the exhibit uh, be there? Is it permanent? And she would like to bring her granddaughter there. Oh. I'm not sure if she's talking about your exhibit or our exhibit at the Tampa Bay History <laughs> Center. Well, we we'll can both answer, answer that question. Yeah. Answer both. Yeah. Um, well, the exhibit at the Smithsonian is at the National Museum of American History is currently slated to be up until August. It was extended till August 30, um, yeah, 30 days half September, April, June, and November, all the rest of 31, August 31st of 2021. But we are currently looking at extending that um, because of the second COVID shutdown. We're just looking to see if we can make that longer, and we're in um, our various offices are looking at looking to see if that's a possibility. Right. So, with hope that show will be open into the into the fall or the winter of mm -hmm. of twenty twenty one. Thank you, Nancy. How about you? And the poster exhibit at Tampa Bay History Center. How long is that going to be up? And probably two more months, and then we'll be ready to uh, change it out to another Smithsonian traveling poster exhibit. So, please come quickly. Okay. <laughs> And this will be our last question for the evening. Lisa Kathleen, what is your favorite artifact in the exhibit? Uh, <laughs> gosh, that's always like asking what your favorite child is. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it changes on, on, on different days, but I, I love the Jailed for Freedom pins. I think they are just the most amazing, these tiny little silver jail doors that were given to the women who were imprisoned for picketing the White House. And they're just, a t they're based on the Holloway prison pin that were given to the British suffragettes who were imprisoned. So it's bringing this tradition forward. Um, we, I have my own reproduction that I wear. Um, it, it, it's a symbol for, for modern women protesting um, and honoring, honoring the suffrage tradition. It's, I think it's just a lovely, a lovely, lovely piece. And, they, and there's a mystery to it. So everybody check their junk drawer. There were a hundred and a hundred and change distributed to suffragists, and we only know where about ten of them are. Oh. That's a lot of pins that are floating around somewhere in the country, and you know maybe because it looks a little like toy jewelry. If you don't know what you're looking at, maybe because they were reproductions made, so they're mixed in with reproductions. We are desperate to figure out where the rest of the pins are. We don't necessarily want to take it from you. If you want to keep it as family history, we're not trying to you know, maraud and find all of them, but we, we love to know where they are. It's just such a wonderful mystery. Where did the pins go? So I highly, if you, you think you have a suffragist in your family or some kind of connection, check around those junk drawers and see if you've got, you know, in the jewelry boxes, and see if you've got a tiny little jailed, silver jail door with a heart-shaped lock. Thank you, you and, and ask us, we'll help you, we'll help you. I honestly, I've never seen it before. So thank you very much for showing that to us. Um, uh, before I turn it back over to Nancy to close us out here, I, I did want to put a little Florida spin on the end of this and um, thought we might have a little time to go to this website, but we don't. So I'm going to give you the website and yeah, uh, all the right attendees, there. you're welcome to go to it. It's a fun uh, website. It's floridasuffrage100.org. So the number 100, floridasuffrage100.org. And if um, you scroll down a little bit, there is a quiz, a Florida suffrage quiz with 10 questions. 
And I have to admit, I only got seven right. And I thought I knew a lot. So um, <laughs> it's a fun uh, little quiz to do. And it might be uh, fun for your family or for your group to start off a discussion. But I encourage you to go to the website nonetheless. Obviously, last year was the 100th anniversary of the passage. And it was also the 100th anniversary of the founding of the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. So we had all sorts of wonderful celebrations planned and um, none of those happened. So we don't mind celebrating a year later. So um, keep those celebrations coming and uh, let us know about them. Thank you all for being here tonight. Nancy, I'll let you close us out. Thank you very much, Lisa, Kathleen, and Leanna. It was awesome to hear this, a wonderful tribute to women's history, and I appreciate you both being with us. That's Thank all. you all so much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.